So you're a business owner and you've heard about captive insurance companies and you go to your CPA and say, hey, I have a question about captive insurance companies. He's going to say, no, now what's your question? In this video, we're going to actually debunk why 831Bs are still very viable for the right business owners. If you go out and Google 831B, you will probably find a lot of information that discusses the IRS crackdown on 831Bs. And although a lot of that is true, it's full of a lot of misinformation. So let me just explain why the IRS is cracking down on some 831Bs. If you remember from one of our previous videos, 831B insurance companies only pay taxes on their investment earnings. So you have businesses in the past that were setting up captives and paying millions of dollars of premium over to their captive insurance companies and they never had any claims. So all it was was a large bank. Now, not having claims is not necessarily a bad thing, but what raised the IRS's ire was these captives were writing policies that they really had no chance of having a claim on. So it was like writing hurricane coverage for Eugene, Oregon on a Sunday afternoon. I mean, that's, that's how crazy these policies were. And they were charging exorbitant premiums for that. You know, in one tax court case, the client was paying a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in terrorism insurance. And they owned a store in Scottsdale, Arizona that didn't do that much revenue. So as a result, the IRS came in and they said, look, this isn't valid coverage under section 162. They said the amount of premium you're paying does not equate to the risk that you have. So when you go out and you can buy a, a policy in the traditional market for $5,000 and you're charging $50,000 inside your own captive, the IRS says that's not valid and reasonable. And I think the IRS got it right in that circumstance. Now, the IRS, when they went after captive insurance companies, they went after certain promoters. So they went after certain captive managers as a promoter of a tax shelter because they felt these were the ones that were doing it most egregiously, where the premiums weren't right based on the risk. They wrote policies that had no chance of having a claim on them. They, the IRS and the tax court noted that the business owner bought policies, but they had claims in their business that they never submitted over to their captive. So they just went wholesale and just disallowed these. So right now, the estimate is that there's anywhere between 750 and 1500 cases for 831Bs filed in tax court. So, so far since 2015, the IRS has only heard five of these cases and they've only come out with three verdicts. And not surprisingly, all three of those verdicts went against the taxpayer. Now, let me tell you the way the tax court works. When the IRS has a thousand cases that, that are all filed in tax court. So they can pick and choose which cases they want to try first. What cases do you think they choose? The ones with the best set of facts for the taxpayer or the ones with the worst set of facts for the taxpayer and best set of facts for the IRS? You guessed it. They litigated the ones that had the best set of facts for the IRS and worst set of facts. So anybody in the captive industry, you know, when they went through the cases, they were not surprised at the verdicts that came out against the taxpayer because these were done incorrectly and inappropriately. They were covering risk or priced in certain ways that were not valid and reasonable when you just took a surface look at those. Now I do think that more cases will come down the road where it's more favorable for the taxpayer. But in, this in these tax court rulings, the IRS said, 
we don't think 831Bs are bad. We think that they're valid and reasonable for the right businesses. All we know are bad 831Bs are bad, but they also acknowledge that there's good ones. So our business has never been more brisk because the people that are coming to us, they realize based on those tax court rulings that the IRS has said there's valid and reasonable reasons to set up a captive insurance company. So that's what we, we tell clients. So if you have workers comp, general liability, if you're a trucking company and you have commercial auto insurance, you know, those are very valid insurance policies. Now, using the, the argument that we used before about hurricane coverage in Oregon, you know, if you go to any reputable captive manager and say, we want to cover risk that could never happen in our business, a reputable captive manager will say, you know what, you're not a valid prospect for a captive. But if you have good amount of premiums, your claims are lower than your industry peers, and we can go and get reinsurance, there's no reason not to consider a captive because it's a very valid and reasonable and Congress and IRS approved vehicle done the right way. So if you go to Google or you hear from an advisor that 831B captives are dead, just keep in the back of your mind that that's not exactly true. The IRS has said bad captives are bad and good captives are good. I want to thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those down below. Also, I'd recommend you go to our website. It's riskmgmtadvisors.com. That's riskmgmtadvisors.com. And go down and download the ultimate guide to captive insurance companies. It gives summaries of all the key points about captives. It also has great information on the PAP Act and some of the tax court rulings. So you can know the facts and circumstances that the IRS says are good and bad. Once again, thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you on our next video.